Hey everyone. Hey, happy Tuesday. Uh, welcome to the State Department. Uh, so, uh, before I get to your questions, I just uh, we have with us today Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Population, Migration, and Refugees, Ann Richard, here to uh, talk a little bit about humanitarian assistance uh, to Syrians as well as refugees. Uh, so, without further ado, Ann, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, last week, President Obama hosted the Leaders' Summit on Refugees, where 49 countries and several international organizations pledged to assist refugees worldwide by increasing humanitarian assistance, opportunities for formal refugee resettlement and other legal channels of admission, and opportunities for education and lawful employment. In his remarks, the President said that in the face of a displacement crisis, unlike any we have seen since World War II, as Americans, we're determined to do our part. We have been working hard all year to increase our own refugee admissions, and I am pleased to report that later this week we will meet our goal of welcoming more refugees than we have in the last 15 years. We are honored to provide a fresh start to nearly 85,000 of the world's most vulnerable people. Today I am proud to announce that the United States is providing more than $364 million in additional life-saving humanitarian assistance for those affected by the war in Syria. This new funding brings U.S. humanitarian assistance in response to this conflict to over $5.9 billion since the start of the crisis. Faced with the unprecedented scale of tragedy and human suffering that Syrians have endured for more than five years and continue to endure today, this announcement reflects the immense generosity of the American people. It will support desperately needed food, shelter, safe drinking water, medical care, and other urgent help to millions of Syrians and refugee hosting communities. But getting help to people who desperately need it requires access. The Assad regime and its backers have the ability to allow the United Nations and other humanitarian relief organizations to do their work. Instead of helping, Russia and the Assad regime are bombing humanitarian convoys, hospitals, and first responders trying desperately to keep people alive. The regime denies safe passage for humanitarian convoys, removes medical supplies from UN deliveries, and slashes the overall amount of aid. This is unacceptable. We reiterate our call for sustained and unimpeded humanitarian access to Aleppo and to all those in need throughout Syria and around the region. We recognize that along with emergency relief, we must address the long-term development needs of Syria's neighbors. And the funding we are providing will continue to support communities in neighboring countries that have so generously hosted Syrian refugees. The United States maintains a strong commitment to assisting those in need around the world including the millions of Syrians forced to flee their homes in this tragic conflict. So that's the statement. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Anne, for taking some of your questions, yeah. if you have any. Please go ahead. Yeah, just on the, um, the 85,000, I've got two, two parts, one on the number of refugees and then one on this new aid. Um, on the 85,000, th this, include, this includes presumably the 10,000 Syrians that That's right. You had, but, it's more than 10,000. Okay, can, do you have an updated number? Yeah, it's going to be, be close to 12,500. Okay, so you actually exceeded the 12, yeah, the, 10, the president's goal. And is it possible, maybe not now, immediately now, but to get a breakdown of where the others, at least by, re, by region, are from? I know that when yeah. in the, just so we, you know, were there any others that exceeded the. Um, what we do is we target. consult once a year with Congress, and we have an overall total, that's a ceiling, right. and then we say how much per region, and then right. we have an unallocated amount left over. And so we use the unallocated to make sure that if we have one from any particular part of the world, we can uh, fit them within a, that sub part of the ceiling. Okay. But uh, we can get you those numbers. Thanks. And then on the money, uh, the $364 million uh, that you're announcing today. Where, where is this being taken from some other account? No, this is money that um, we were provided by Congress for the year, and this is probably our last uh, contribution, our last announcement of the fiscal year okay. towards so Syria. When you say the year, you mean the one that ends on five, That's right. four days. That's right. And then um, do you have the uh, 5.9 billion total since the start, which is all uh, quite a bit of money. That goes to, where does that mostly go to, to the UN? Um, a lot of it goes, is spent through uh, the United Nations uh, humanitarian agencies. 
So our big partner is the UN uh, Agency High Commissioner for Refugees, but also World Food Program, uh, UNICEF, uh, UNFPA, the UN Population Fund. And um, it also goes through non-governmental organizations that are working in the region. But most of it goes to people who are actually outside of Syria, no. correct? No. No. Okay. Where, how, um, how of the work? amount we're announcing today, three quarters will go inside Syria. And uh, generally, it's been about half and half. Okay. Have you any more? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. So uh, does a new funding include uh, the funding for ERCM program? And if you could please elaborate on that uh, program, um, does that help to encourage countries such as Mexico and Ethiopia to take in more refugees? And in the U.S. dimension, how effective is that program to address the refugee crisis? Well, this is a new program. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a part of uh, an overall approach to addressing the refugee crisis. It was uh, put together uh, in the lead up to the President's summit, the Leaders' Summit last week. And it's, um, uh, we are providing $11 million to help start it to the International Organization for Migration and the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, because this will be a joint mechanism. So it's the Emerging Resettlement Countries Joint Support Mechanism. And what we found was that in asking countries to begin resettlement programs, to think about accepting refugees, they said they could think about it, but they would need some help. And so this fund was set up to help uh, cover the costs of screening refugees and the transportation to get the refugees to these uh, new resettlement countries. So just to clarify, out of 11 million of the new funding goes to this program? 11 million of uh, funding that we have separate from the funding for Syria, so it's not part of the 364 million. Uh, 11 million from our Bureau's funding will go to this new program. If I may, I would like to also ask another question. Um, with the surge seen in Jordan earlier this year to process Syrian refugees be repeated in uh, FY 2017? We'll look at different options to um, proceed towards that new goal of 110,000. Uh, one option would be potentially to repeat the surge. I, I think the surge worked last year, but it should not become a routine way of of, of our uh, vetting process. We'd like to uh, uh, be able to do this in our existing routine uh, operations during the course of the year. Mm -hmm. Nick? Um, can I just ask, from Bloomberg News, can I just ask, uh, on the 10,000 or 12,500 figure for Syria, is there any plan to increase that number in the next fiscal year? Uh, and also, um, is the U.S. reconsidering its vetting procedures for Syrian refugees? Uh, in light of concerns expressed by Donald Trump and others that U.S. vetting is insufficiently rigorous? Um, we don't have a target number for a number of Syrians for next year. Um, this administration has been very clear that we want to bring more Syrians. So my own um, guidance to our staff is that we want to bring even more than we brought this year without having a target. Um, our vetting is e extremely rigorous and careful, and it's been gone over now uh, for months uh, by a lot of uh, colleagues and analysts. And so uh, it's, it's the most careful way of bringing anyone into the United States, of any visitor to the United States. So we have great faith in it to screen out people who don't belong in the program. So can I just ask you, um, uh, given your role, what your response was to, you know, Donald Trump Jr.'s uh, comparing refugees to Skittles. Did he do that? <laughs> he didn't see that tweet. I, you know, I'm not paying attention to the election. Okay. Michelle? I, I wonder on the, the uh, 12,500 if you've had any difficulty in finding places within the United States since so many governors are saying they don't want to have Syrian refugees. Um, 
And then secondly, you were up on Capitol Hill recently talking about, I know not the number of Syrians, but increasing the overall number to 110,000. I wonder what kind of reception you got up there. Um, so uh, on September 13th, we went up for our annual consultation with Congress. I would say we got a mixed reception. We got a lot of questions about um, the vetting process, uh, which continues the conversation we've been having since last fall, and also questions about, um, uh, you know, a lot of the basics of the program, of how well refugees do once they get to the United States. And we think we have a very good story to tell about that. Refugees tend to be very successful once they get to the U.S. Not in the short term, but definitely in the medium and longer term. And of course, small kids become Americans fastest of any member of the family. Uh, what was the first part, Michelle? Um, about uh, resettling Syrian oh. into different states when there's so many restrictions that governors are placing on that. Uh, well, this is a federal program. And so we have 180 cities across the United States uh, where we currently resettle refugees. And that list is likely to grow in the coming months. We have a lot of municipalities stepping forward and expressing an interest in, in uh, resettling refugees. Yeah, so I'm, I, I think the United States can accept lots and lots and lots of refugees uh, and, and, sir, and provide a home for them. The, the thing that um, in, in some ways limits the number we bring in is that this careful vetting process we have, this careful system that we run to bring people in where we have to review their personal stories, make sure that their histories stand up to scrutiny, and make sure we screen out anyone who's up to no good. Uh, but in terms of the ability for American cities to welcome people, there's a great deal of of um, receptivity to having uh, refugees in cities and towns across the U.S. One of the things we look for, though, is we try not to send people to refugees to towns where there aren't a lot of jobs, and we try not to send them to towns where the housing is very expensive. And that's why the consultation with uh, local leaders is an essential part of the program. I just go ahead. Follow up to the next question, uh, since the fiscal year is coming up, when? Do you expect to announce your target date, your target number for Syrian refugees in the coming year? And, and you know, there have been calls to increase it by, you're saying you want more, there have been calls to increase it by as many as 55,000. You know, so we don't you usually have a target by nationality. We usually have it by region. So we may not have a target number for uh, you Syrians in the, re that's right. Yeah, so, but yeah. not next year. The president said that. Um, so it's not a normal thing to do. Um, I, I don't know if the president will want to do that in the next few months or if a new administration would want to do that. Certainly we'll all be tracking it very carefully. So it may be left to the next administration is what you're saying. I think a president at any time can, can look at the numbers and establish, you know, a goal for us. Mm -hmm. The ceiling, the 85,000 this fiscal year and 110,000 next fiscal year, that's a statutory requirement. But the number, the 10,000 that we exceeded this year, that was just a, a, a sort of an internal challenge for the administration. Thank you so much. Okay. I have a very brief topper. Secretary Kerry will deliver remarks on the importance of the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, to our national security, our economic standing at home and abroad, our strategic interests in the Asia-Pacific, and our diplomatic leadership around the world. And he'll do so at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars in Washington at 11 a.m. on Wednesday. That's tomorrow, September 28th. And we'll have a notice to the press uh, with more details on that. Matt. That was brief. I told you. I strive to be brief <laughs> in my briefings. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Well, it is the operative word. That's right. Preceding the <laughs> gerundish. And too and often they're not. I, I um, let's start. Let's start where we uh, left off before the TPP speech announcement on Syria. Yeah. Um, has there been any further contact between the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov? Uh, if there, not. 
Sure. Well, go ahead. No, no, uh, there has not. Um, okay, so in the anticipating that answer, are there any plans to, or are we in the situation where it's just hopeless and there's not any real reason to have a conversation? Uh, I think there are always plans to, and I, um, you know, while I can't, uh, you know, say with certainty that they'll talk in the next 24 hours or 48 hours, I certainly know that the Secretary is open to talking to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, so I don't want to give the impression that uh, there's no interest in keeping that channel open. In fact, I think there is. Um, but I think, as I said yesterday, um, we need to see some measures offered by Russia and, and on the part of the regime that change the reality on the ground. And that goes without saying, given the continued onslaught of uh, the regime on, uh, on Aleppo. Are these teams still meeting in Geneva? Or is that basically, is the, is the ceasefire or the cessation of hostilities task force or whatever it was called, is that, is that basically a dead item now? Uh, that's a fair question. I, I don't know whether they're still meeting in, in, in Geneva. I can take that question. Well, I, two, I mean, there are two, two parts to it. One, I mean, are they actually talking now? But also, does this structure that you guys are we created, still, yeah. the, that the ISSG created, is it, is it still alive? My understanding is it hasn't been disbanded, but certainly, you know, the, you know again, we're under no illusions that the, the cessation of hostilities, uh, such as we envisioned it in Geneva um, 10 or so days ago, is, uh, is still in effect. How about in Vienna several months ago? Fair point. You've said that Secretary Kerry's open to restarting the dialogue. Does that mean he's waiting by the phone? No, not at all. Have to call him? Not at all. Oh, has I, he, has, I, he, has not, he made calls that have been refused? Not at all, um, on either count. Uh, look, I, I think Secretary is very clear both in Cartagena yesterday in Colombia, uh, but also in his remarks over the weekend, um, you know, that he has not closed the door on this uh, diplomatic process. And as a Secretary of State, he'll never do that. Uh, uh, he said it would be diplomatic malpractice to do so, and uh, and his point is is that uh, as long as he's Secretary of State, he is going to pursue uh, a diplomatic process that ends the fighting and allows for a peaceful political transition in Syria. But that said, uh, you know we're under no illusions given the intensity of the conflict and uh, in and around Aleppo over the past 72 hours uh, with barrel bombs, indiscriminate bombings uh, that. Uh, that were anywhere near reaching the seven days of uh, but, but cessation but, but, but of uh, the yeah. diplomatic process. Is that simply the channel between himself <laughs> and the Russian foreign minister, or are there other? Diplomatic no, we continue to consult with other members of the uh, of the ISSG, uh, and that continues. So, I mean, but, um, but in your answer to Matt's question, sure. he said obviously he's still keen to talk, but he's not going to initiate. I, I think again, we're um, look. I, I, I think where he left it last week in, in his most recent public uh, remarks yesterday is, you know, um, what's happening in Aleppo is unacceptable. Uh, we recognize that the cessation of hostilities is badly weakened, if we could say, uh, even that, uh, and that we need to see proposals uh, going forward on how to resuscitate this uh, cessation of hostilities. And what the Secretary talked about was reestablishing credibility in the process. And, you know, that's – he talked about it when he spoke in the Security Council uh, last week, but that's what we're looking for. So we continue to be open to having that dialogue and those discussions with Russia. And does he believe that Russia does want to restart the dialogue? Well, again, that comes down to, I mean, I think we're always open uh, to that, or at least we remain open to that. Let me put it that way. Please. The hostilities is badly weakened, but, I mean. That may over even in itself be uh, overstating it. Yeah, uh, I mean, isn't it gone? You have a massive air it, thank you. and ground assault on the largest city in the country. It's unacceptable, and, and that's absolutely right. What's happening in, in Aleppo is unacceptable. Uh, but, he said as much, and it's. You're right that we – so I, I guess my point is we cannot look at what is happening and simply turn away and pretend that there is uh, still a credible cessation of hostilities in place. So if it is unacceptable, is the U.S. government 
willing to do anything other than to remain open to resuming a dialogue with Russia to try to stop it, or are you just going to accept it? Well, uh, sorry, I didn't hear you. And, um, so, uh, you know, we very much uh, call on Russia uh, to stop attacking the civilian residents of Aleppo. Um, we're going to continue, as I said, Secretary Kerry, Secretary of State Kerry, um, as the nation's leading diplomat, is going to continue to pursue the diplomatic options that he has left uh, in front of him. Uh, and uh, as he said, he's going to continue to pursue those until they're exhausted. Um, as to what other options or other uh, directions we may go in, uh, I can't speak to any or I can't announce anything or even lean into anything today because uh, while those discussions continue, and I talked about it yesterday, we're still pursuing the agreement that we reached in, in, in Geneva as the best way forward. Are any of your Gulf allies now proposing uh, uh, more vehemently uh, providing additional arms, including perhaps man pads, to the opposition? I, I wouldn't presume to speak on their behalf, and I'd have to refer you to them to talk about what they may or may not do. I think speaking broadly, we have said that uh, that there are scenarios out there where if this collapses altogether, if it descends further into conflict, that there is that possibility. But I can't speak to them on the behalf of these governments. Are there any contingency plans to deal with the humanitarian catastrophe when Aleppo falls? Well, I mean, I look, we're insofar as we're, one, announcing uh, more humanitarian assistance, uh, both within and I, th I think uh, Anne just said, you know, three quarters, if I'm not mistaken, of that will go inside Syria. Uh, we are looking at trying to alleviate the humanitarian suffering and looking towards uh, how that might uh, even increase in the days and weeks ahead. And I think also we're going to continue to push hard for humanitarian access. I know the World Health Organization called for, uh, in fact, uh, uh, humanitarian corridors uh, to evacuate the uh, injured from Aleppo, and we certainly support that. But we also uh, would add that you shouldn't uh, – the injured shouldn't have to leave their homes to get this kind of treatment. So what we want to see is sustained of access. Of people live in East uh, I agree. That and would be a, it's, if they end up on the road, I, I agree. borders closed. I, I agree, and those are all uh, things we're looking at and considering uh, going forward. But, uh, you know, uh, right now we just want to see an end to the fighting. Mark, I want to follow up. I'll get to you up on this. Arshad's question. Yes, sir. And start by reading you some statistics from the White Helmets. This is the um, unarmed uh, civilian rescue workers in Syria and Aleppo. They said, just over the past eight days, a 1,000 dead, 1,700 airstrikes, 19 of them with bunker busters, 200 of the strikes with cluster bombs, um, hospitals now declaring they're no longer able to take in new patients, only 30 doctors left in Aleppo. Is it setting aside the idea that the ceasefire is not working, is it possible to argue that the atmosphere of the ceasefire has actually made things worse. Has this brief cessation led to an even worse bombardment and humanitarian situation? Of course, not intentionally, but right. would you not make that, that argument? You know, Justin, it, it's hard to, it's hard to evaluate uh, what the strategy behind uh, this flagrant onslaught on Aleppo is. Uh, we talked a little bit about it yesterday, whether it's the regime's insistence on pursuing a military solution uh, to the conflict there, even though they and even though Russia uh, claims to uh, want a political solution uh, and that there is no military solution. Uh, it's really hard to evaluate what's behind uh, this uh, this acceleration and this ramping up of its assaults on innocent uh, civilians in Aleppo. Um, we're going to continue to push hard uh, through whatever channels we have uh, for the, for the uh, 
for the regime to stand down and to uh, try to work, as I said, to put back in place uh, some kind of reduction in the level of violence. But uh, those statistics you read uh, are uh, extraordinary. And you said they're from the White Helmets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, we just obviously, uh, Secretary attended a, an event uh, when he was in New York uh, about the White Helmets, and we certainly commend their selfless, uh, courageous efforts in the face of uh, these attacks. Sorry, that's okay. So different from the Yazidis who were on Mount Sinjar, yeah. from the Libyans who Gaddafi said he was going to hunt down like rats. What, what's the difference here? You have 250,000 people in a defined area that are now surrounded, that are subject not just to air, but now to ground assault. Um, what's, what, why did the United States deem it to be in the U.S. national interest to intervene in those other circumstances, but not in this circumstance? Well, um, first of all, uh, I don't want to necessarily get in the habit of comparing uh, different conflicts and different circumstances, uh, such as the ones you raised, uh, because every uh, set of circumstances is a little bit different. And in the case of Aleppo, in the case of Syria, uh, it's hard to find one that's more complex. And uh, we've talked about that. Um, but also the fact that, you know, really until the past uh, few weeks, um, we felt like we were on a, a firm path towards a possible uh, diplomatic resolution to this. We still believe that's possible. As I said, we haven't given up on that process, but uh, that's where we still are in terms of our approach. Now, that doesn't mean we're not uh, mindful, I don't know how anyone could not be, of the tremendous humanitarian suffering uh, that's going on right now in Aleppo. Uh, and that's why we're working so hard to ramp up our assistance, but also to gain uh, access for humanitarian convoys. And I would just finish by saying we'll continue to weigh all, we'll continue to weigh all options. Those discussions are ongoing. I don't want to uh, rule anything out, but right now we're focused on uh, the diplomatic one. When, when you say you don't want to, I'm sorry, last one for me. Yeah, when please. you say you don't want to rule anything out, you know, Secretary Powell once stood at that exact podium sure. and said, in early 2003, the time for diplomacy is over. Is it conceivable to you, since you don't want to rule anything out, that the administration may come to the conclusion that having expended, you know, five years of effort on diplomacy, and particularly three and a half under Secretary Kerry, that the time for diplomacy is over and that you need to make use of other elements of national power? Or is that not conceivable to you? I, I think those, again, as part of, uh, frankly, a healthy debate within any administration, uh, those conversations are always ongoing. How you approach or how you resolve uh, an issue like this or a problem like this, a conflict like this. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, that's a, a, a decision for the president to make. Please. A Reuters article, uh, co-authored by Arshad, by the way, cites U.S. officials who believe that Gulf states may soon begin to arm Syrian rebels with manned pads to shoot down aircraft. <coughs> One U.S. official was quoted as saying, the Saudis have always thought that the way to get the Russians to back off is what worked in Afghanistan 30 years ago, negating their air power by giving manned pads to the Mujahideen, end quote. About two weeks ago, U.S.-backed rebels drove U.S. special forces out of the town of al Rai, shouting, infidels, crusaders, dogs, pigs, at them, their words. In light of the fact that some rebels are quite openly anti-American, are you worried that these men pats could one day be used to shoot down U.S. planes? So first of all, I'm not going to confirm uh, what uh, anonymous U.S. officials may or may not have said. Uh, I, I think I'll just answer your question more broadly by saying that uh, we cannot dictate what other countries, and I'm not naming names, but may or may not decide to do in terms of supporting certain uh, groups within Syria. 
So you um, would not try to stop them from providing the rebels with man pads with uh, anti-aircraft weapons? I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, you know, ultimately, uh, and we've talked about this, is that you may have a further deterioration uh, on either side, uh, uh, both among the opposition but also uh, 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 by the regime. And by deterioration, I mean uh, uh, more arming and more conflict between them, an intensification of the conflict. Uh, as to, you know, the specific comments that were made about what or may, what may or may not be provided to, by governments to different rebel groups, I'm just not in a position to confirm or speak to that from this podium. Sorry. Does the administration do anything to stop its allies from providing these powerful weapons to rebels in Syria? What we're engaged with, our allies, and frankly all of uh, the members of the ISSG, uh, which is, as we know, uh, uh, not necessarily uh, all like-minded uh, governments or nations, uh, but they all share purportedly a common vision for the outcome that they want to see in Syria. We're in consultation with all of those governments at all times, including last week in New York. What came out of that ISSG meeting last week in New York was a a recommitment, even in the face of what was happening uh, in Syria uh, then, and has intensified and worsened over the uh, uh, ensuing days, was a commitment to the Geneva Agreement that we are that would put in place uh, seven days, followed by establishment of a JIC, followed by the grounding of uh, Syrian regime's uh, air power. Please, Barbara. Just to follow up on Justin's question. Yep. Does the administration see what's happening in Aleppo as a qualitative difference from the violence we've seen over the past years? I mean, that's what's suggested by the reaction in the Security Council on Sunday, the, the uh, anger about the bunker busters and the, um, the, uh, the allegations of war crimes against Russia. So is, is this seen as a change, a qualitative change? Uh, I, I think uh, without necessarily trying to characterize it, uh, I think we said it's, you know, it's a violation of, of international laws. I think, as Secretary Kerry put it uh, uh, in speaking at the UN last week, um, I think he called it a flagrant violation of international law uh, when uh, you've got uh, indiscriminate attacks against civilian populations, uh, strikes that are hitting uh, civilian targets, um, uh, hospitals, et cetera. Uh, there has been an alarming increase in uh, both the intensity and the uh, uh, and the targeting uh, of these attacks. Uh, I don't think, as I said, I, I think we're all aware of that in this room. But if there's an alarming increase in the intensity and the targeting and the introduction of new, um, more powerful weapons, you still continue with the same strategy? I mean, it's, if, the, if the situation has gotten that much worse, the same strategy is somehow supposed to deal with it? Or what I would say to that is, you know, we are, uh, within the State Department, focused on the diplomatic side of this equation, and we're continuing to pursue the diplomatic options that are available to us. We worked through many months to reach the agreement that was reached in Geneva with the Russians. We still believe it's a viable path forward, despite or in spite of uh, the uh, uh, increased fighting that we've seen over the past week or so. Um, we need to get back on track. What we've talked about, how to get there. Secretary suggested uh, some proposals, but we need to see Russia's uh, response to those proposals. Can I just ask one quick question on Turkey as well? Of course. Um, do you have any information from Tony Blinken's meetings in Turkey today? There's been a – the Turkish president has called a meeting of his top officials, all of his top officials tonight, with no suggestion of what it's about. But the speculation is that it's possibly off the back of Mr. Blinken's meeting and it's about – Turkish I don't. Uh, I mean, I don't have much of a readout. I apologize. Um, he's obviously, as you mentioned, in Ankara, uh, along with uh, uh, Special Presidential Envoy Brett McGurk, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Jonathan Cohen, and the uh, Commander of the Operation Inherent Resolve, uh, Lieutenant General Townsend. Um, he is meeting, uh, I think he's uh, discussing with uh, Turkish officials uh, plans to take back Mosul, Raqqa, and Dabiq. Uh, and he's had meetings today with Turkish officials focused on the details uh, of how to implement those plans uh, along with or with the, in cooperation with our Turkish partners. 
Uh, I know he uh, visited uh, also the Turkish parliament earlier today, uh, which was, as we know, damaged in the attempted coup uh, earlier this year. Um, if I can get a further readout or additional readout, we'll certainly make that available to you guys. Yeah, let's finish up with Syria, please. Just on the 364 million, I just wanted to follow up on another question. Yeah, sure. If three fourths of that money is going to be spent inside Syria and humanitarian aid convoys are getting bombed, I mean, how, how do you spend that money in inside Syria? What what do you spend it on? Do you have sort of details? So, um, and I'm not sure that. And mentioned this, but we are going to put out uh, a fact sheet, or should be out uh, now uh, already, about uh, the 364 million. And in that fact sheet, it does talk a little bit about who we work with, uh, the op different operations uh, of the United Nations that Anne mentioned, and other international organizations, NGOs as well. Uh, um, that through these organizations, we're able to provide assistance to I think 14 governance in Syria. Um, uh, supporting, helping alleviate uh, critical humanitarian needs. Uh, but you're absolutely right that, you know, there are parts of Syria that still remain what we call besieged areas, and we still don't have uh, full, unlimited access to those areas. So that remains a challenge. But there are areas, obviously, where uh, at least some humanitarian assistance is able to filter in. And always in the goal. Uh, our goal, rather, in providing that humanitarian assistance is to be able to keep people in place. We don't want to see people displaced either internally or uh, obviously to the uh, countries and regions that border uh, Syria, but even beyond that to uh, Europe and elsewhere. Um, but uh, we're going to continue to work through our partners on the ground in Syria. We are able to provide, as I said, limited, and there's people who can, far more expert who can talk about how we do that, uh, but we are able to. Uh, work, obviously, within a very challenging security environment where these people are able to work to provide some humanitarian assistance. But again, it's not enough. It's not full access. But has that been cleared with the government? I mean, aid in Syria has been sort of a central part of this conflict and has sometimes, you know, the government accuses aid groups or feels that aid is going to rebels. I mean, it's – right. surely there must be a concern that this could only exacerbate the conflict. Well, and it certainly speaks to, again, the courage uh, of uh, some of these aid groups, including the UN, but also these NGOs that operate in that kind of uh, environment. Um, you know, they continue to uh, – God bless you uh, – they continue to, you know, push the boundaries um, and continue – and I think that was evident uh, last week when, you know, right after the attack on that aid convoy headed to Aleppo, I think 24 to 48 hours later, they were again staging convoys to try to get access to some of those uh, places in Syria. I think it speaks to the courage of these individuals. But, but have have you cleared this aid with? Has there been any coordination with the government? Uh, I think I'd have to leave it to the UN and to the NGOs themselves to talk about whatever clearances or. But my understanding is that they would always seek first and foremost, to have the authorization of the Syrian government to operate within whatever geographical area they're operating in, just as we attempted to do last week for this aid convoy that was struck. So bearing in mind – I'll get to you a second. Yeah, um, yeah the, over the dying days of the ceasefire, the, the narrative from U.S. officials is we'd leave the door open, but our patience uh, isn't limitless. But now it's more a question of, well, it would be malpractice close the window at any time to uh, any kind of peaceful solution. Is the, the idea of the patients being limitless now being dropped and you, you saying now, in fact, it is limitless, limitless. You've got to keep the window open. Well, uh, again, I think, you know, we are at a difficult juncture. Um, but, you know, that's often the case in conflict zones, uh, and certainly one as complex as uh, Syria. Um, and despite all of the setbacks and all of the challenges, uh, we still believe it's worthwhile uh, to pursue a, a diplomatic process that was worked out with Russia to the agreement and consent of uh, the other members of the ISSG. Uh, 
and frankly, uh, that many within the moderate Syrian opposition had also bought into. But again, recognizing that when you've got the moderate opposition under attack in Aleppo and elsewhere, they're not going to adhere to any ceasefire or cessation of hostilities. And we talked a little bit about this dynamic yesterday. Uh, that just exacerbates what's already a difficult situation because they're under attack by the regime. Of course, they're going to defend themselves. So I, I don't know how to put it in a way that conveys the sense that we are trying to uh, always resuscitate uh, the diplomatic process that we believe can eventually lead to a peaceful resolution of the conflict in Syria. But we also recognize that it's gotten very hard. Please, sir. Uh, my question is about Panama's expedition request. Let's get finished with on these other questions. Cause, I'm sorry, sir. We, our common procedure is to move through all the different regions. Turkey, uh, yesterday, Turkish spokesman finally said that YPG forces had moved east of the Euphrates, which is something that the United States has been saying for weeks. Yes. And I wondered, is that since uh, Deputy Secretary of State Blinken and McGurk had arri just arrived in Turkey, I wondered, is that something that they helped clarify? And in any case, does that Turkish statement about the YPG satisfying their geographical requirements, does that indicate that the U.S.-Turkish dispute over the YPG role in fighting ISIS has been largely resolved, or is it still an issue? Well. Uh so uh, we also saw those remarks yesterday, um, and it was gratifying to see that they also uh, uh, confirmed what we had been saying for some time, which is that um, in the past, I'm not sure the time frame, but the past weeks or so, that we've seen them, uh, these groups, uh, uh, Syrian Kurdish groups, uh, who had been fighting in that area, again, adhere to their commitments that they made to us and withdrawal from the area around the Euphrates, east of the Euphrates. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, we certainly, as we said at the time, the last thing we want to see is these forces come into uh, conflict with Turkish forces who are on the ground as well. And we also called for a de-escalation at the time and urged that uh, all of the parties there keep their eye on the prize, so to speak, in keeping the pressure on Daesh, keeping the pressure on destroying and dislodging Daesh, because that's the overarching security concern. So even as Turkey sought to reestablish control over its border region, and you had these various groups, including the Syrian Kurds, working uh, to liberate areas uh, also in northern Syria uh, that were Daesh controlled. Uh, we didn't want them to come into conflict. Um, again, it speaks to the complexity of, of the, the battle space there. Um, your last question well, has, I oh, is it all, look, we're going to continue to, sorry, I, didn't, I just remember what you asked. So we're going to continue to have those conversations, as you saw last week um, with uh, Turkish uh, authorities, and we have a Deputy Secretary Blinken in Turkey uh, today with uh, a, a group of uh, 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 government officials and military officials. Um, and we're going to work closely with Turkey to deconflict and to coordinate on efforts to uh, secure their borders, but also to drive, and to drive out and destroy Daesh. But do you think you're making progress towards that goal? Is that what that statement might indicate? Uh, look, I think we're, uh, I think we're... Give you a chance to say yes. I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always careful, you know, you're a spokesperson. Um, no, I think we, I, I, I don't want to say making progress. I, I think we're, uh, we're pleased to see uh, the confirmation, as I said, from the remarks from the Turkish government yesterday. Um, we're going to continue to keep up uh, our engagement with Turkey and with YPG forces in order that there is no kind of uh, conflict, conflict there. Please, Nike. Can I ask a couple of different questions? Um, are we ready <laughs> That's to the idea on? of the briefing. Okay. Yep. Uh, first on Azerbaijan, do you have anything on the referendum in uh, Azerbaijan? Um, because, I think I do. Um, okay. Because uh, opposition yeah. uh, and civil society are saying that um, there was a movement by the to expand the, the presidential power. I yep. wonder if you have anything. To so we are aware, uh, as you noted, that Azerbaijan conducted a constitutional referendum uh, yesterday, came off without any security incidents. Uh, I think the Venice Commission uh, that was uh, in there, or on the ground rather, noted that the process would have benefited from greater public discussion in the lead up to the vote. Uh, we would urge the government to address uh, reports of voting irregularities. Um, 
and we do remain committed to helping Azerbaijanis build a stronger democracy uh, and encourage uh, political transparency and dialogue within the country. Mm -hmm. and um, you had other questions? Yeah. Can I ask about Afghanistan? You certainly can. First, I uh, wonder if you... Of course. Is it, is it good that one family has ruled this country for so long and that the son of the previous ruler can now rule it for even longer? Uh, I think our focus, uh, our shot is on how do we improve uh, the institutions and how do we improve or work with the Azerbaijani people and government to improve uh, the, the process, the democratic process. It's not for us to uh, dictate uh, what the outcome of that democratic process may or may not be, except to say that where there are irregularities, they should be investigated. Where there are glitches in the process, uh, they should be looked at and improved. Is it a democratic process? Well, again, I think we're looking at the election that took place yesterday, and I think we, we found that it was uh, marred by some reports of voting irregularities, and that's what we're going to... Yeah, but, you know, you have situations where people are put in a position where they're able to be presidents for life. Is that, dem is that democracy? Again, uh, I think in any of these kinds of situations, Matt, and we've, you know, uh, Azerbaijan is not unique in having uh, long-standing presidents or heads of state. Well, uh, I'm not saying it's. But it's no, no, no. Let me, let me, but let me finish. No, no. Let me finish. But I, I think that our point of concern uh, is always in trying to work within uh, the structures that are there to improve the democracy or democratic institutions to to improve and work where we can to improve the process rather than we can't dictate that uh, term limits. Please. Can we move on? We can. Uh, Afghanistan. First, uh, do you have anything on the overnight attack uh, at a security outpost near Kunduz? Uh, because reportedly the Taliban was behind it. Let's see if I have anything on that. Um, you're talking about, wh where was this again? Uh, oh, um, yes, I, I, I do. Uh, so you're talking about uh, reports and the outpost near Kunduz, right? Yes. Um, well, we've seen reports, uh, obviously, that Afghan soldiers were killed. Uh, I believe it's uh, reportedly an insider attack. Yes. Uh, we certainly offer our condolences to the, their families, uh, loved ones, and colleagues. Uh, I would say attacks like this only strengthen the resolve, uh, we believe, of Afghans who are fighting with bravery and with determination on the battlefield every day. Uh, we believe that uh, Afghanistan security forces uh, remain determined and resolved to fight for the security of their country and their citizens. And we're going to, we, the U.S., and obviously with our NATO allies and partners, are going to remain committed to supporting those forces, uh, making sure that they've got the capabilities uh, and the training uh, to carry out their mandate. Mm -hmm. And then another question on Afghan. Sure. Um, is a national unity government uh, is nearing a two-year comple uh, completion of its term. What is your assessment on the uh, political reforms required by that deal in Afghanistan? Sure. Um, so uh, you're right that uh, President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah uh, developed uh, a new electoral decree when they were uh, came into office. Um, uh, and that will determine the process for selecting new members of uh, the Independent Elections Commission, as well as the Electoral Complaints Commission. Um, and these are important bodies because they'll manage the elections, uh, and they have to be viewed as credible by Afghans uh, if future elections are to meet uh, even a minimal uh, threshold of success. So we. Uh, are urging and continue to urge uh, both leaders to make more, make more rapid progress on, on that front. Um, we also, as you know, there's going to be the Brussels conference next week um, uh, looking for donor commitments for Afghanistan, uh, and that's going to strengthen Afghan uh, institutions, spur economic growth, uh, support the Afghan government's reform agenda, uh, and send a strong signal to the Afghan people uh, in the region. Uh, that the international community remains committed uh, to a stable and prosperous Afghanistan. But ultimately, these are conversations uh, that need to be had among Afghans and Afghan leaders 
Uh, I'd refer you to the a government of Afghanistan to talk about their political and reform agenda. Uh, a couple of questions. To, Go what ahead. What is going to happen after two years is up? I mean, is the U.S. going to broker extension of that deal? I'm not going to predict what role, except to say that we're, we remain committed to working with uh, the Afghan government and uh, leadership uh, in trying to continue along the reform agenda that they're uh, working on, uh, but also, as you note, to ensure the smooth democratic transitions in the next uh, government. Uh, staying in the region, but a different issue. Yeah. So I'll take one, two, and then back to you for the last. Please. On, um, uh, India today said uh, that talks and data cannot go together, and as such, India informed that it will not be participating in the Regional South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation Summit, which was scheduled to be held in Pakistan next month, in November, I think. Uh, so what's your take on that? I, I U.S. You, observer sure. to that. Yeah, I'd refer you to the government of India to uh, comment on their decision not to attend this uh, this uh, uh, meeting. Um, you know, what we've. Is your, what is the observer take on it? Because you are an observer, you go. We there, are. U.S. goes there. We, I mean, look. I, what I would say more broadly is, and we've said it many times <laughs> uh, from the podium, is we want to see um, closer relations uh, and a normalization of relations, frankly, between India and Pakistan. It would be the, to the benefit of the region. Um, and we want to see de-escalation and the political discourse between the two countries uh, and, and greater uh, communication and uh, coordination between them. What is your prescription for de-escalation of tension? What is the... Your prescription for de-escalation of tension? It's not for us necessarily to offer a prescription. I mean, I think we would, and we've said again many times that, you know, uh, um, we want to see a de-escalation, and that's obviously uh, facts on the ground or actions on the ground, but also within with uh, uh, applies to the rhetoric uh, that's flying back and forth as well. Um, and again, I mean, it's in both countries' mutual interest to put aside tensions, work towards putting aside tensions and de-escalating tensions and uh, establish more normal channels of communication. But do you think the talks and terror can go together? Talks and terror can go together simultaneously? I, I'm not sure what your references or what your okay. inferences. There can be terrorist attack coming from across the border at the same time. I mean, time. clearly we've talked about that before. Is while we've seen Pakistan make uh, progress uh, on some of the terror group, terrorist groups operating within its own borders and carrying out attacks within Pakistan's borders, that we continue to put pressure on Pakistan to uh, respond to those groups who uh, are quote unquote seeking safe haven. Uh, on Pakistan's borders that who are intent on carrying out attacks elsewhere in the region. Please. Thank you, Mark. The first, the first time the United States uh, uh, take individual sanctions on Chinese on companies, is there any other countries U.S. take actions except China? Uh, so you're talking about the, the actions that were announced yesterday, yes. uh, I think by the Department of Treasury and Justice. Um, nothing to preview at this point in time, uh, but would we'll refer you to the Department of Treasury for talking about more about implementing those uh, actions taken yesterday. Second question, and uh, the last week, South Korean Foreign Minister Liu Myung Sae has mentioned about at the UN General Assembly, he noted that. North Korea should be disqualified from UN member status. What is your comment on his name? Um, you're talking about his remarks. Uh, but disqualified. Yeah. North Korean. I mean, I think the call we heard from uh, from public or, uh, of uh, from the. Uh, a foreign minister was it foreign minister's remarks. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, last week uh, from Korea uh, was a natural result uh, of North Korea's continued dangerous provocations in the region. Uh, uh, North Korea's actions continue to undermine stability on the peninsula, um, undermine the credibility and authority of the international system uh, that has repeatedly warned uh, North Korea uh, to abandon its. Uh, nuclear missile program. Uh, so in general, we think it's important for the international community 
uh, to explore options to impose real costs and consequences on North Korea's bad behavior. Uh, but uh, I'd refer you to the North or the, to the Korean government to, for details on their statement. Do you think the North Korea should be deprived of the qualification in member of the United Nations? Uh, again, I think you know I, I, I'm not going to speak directly to that uh, statement by uh, Korea, the Korean government or foreign minister rather. Uh, I think I just spoke to more broadly that as North Korea continually violates uh, the international system, it's incumbent on the international community to look at ways to uh, hold them to account. Please, sir, last question. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, the question is about the extradition request by Panama for uh, the ex-president of their country, uh, Ricardo Martinelli. And, uh, I'd like to ask you, you know, what would you tell us about the process today, but a little bit more broadly, if there are any, if you see any diplomatic obstacles, requests for asylum immunity or anything like that? Yeah, this is an extradition request by the Panamanian government for yes, it. Yeah, so we wouldn't necessarily uh, speak to uh, the details of any extradition request. It's usually uh, uh, kept confidential uh, because it is uh, a legal process and uh, yes, a determination made through a legal process. Uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Justice. They may be, be able to provide you more of a status check uh, if that, uh, as that request moves forward. Uh, but beyond that, I can't really speak to it. Well, Mark, you really didn't think you were going to get away with that, did you? Get, Without being challenged? Get away with. Oh. Yeah. Challenge away, Matt. Well, I'm just thinking about one extradition request that you've been uh, And I said about. usually. <laughs> yeah. And that was, uh, and, that was and, an and exception. Can, can you explain to us why? That was an unusual. Why, why? Why that is an exception, other than the fact that you guys think that it serves your interest to talk about that one, and not necessarily to talk about this one. Well, and for those who may not as know much as we've so he's talking about Gulen. Gulen. Yeah. So as much as we've uh, acknowledged uh, that such an extradition request was made, uh, I don't think we've gotten into the details of the nitty gritty. About dossiers being delivered, and at one point it wasn't enough to be. But a, but. A formal request, but I think and it became sure, an Matt. So, where, so first of all, uh, he's welcome to go to the Department of Justice and see what they can give him in terms of where the status of this is. I just, I'm not, I don't have that information in front of me. But normally, we don't talk about extradition requests. And so, why was the Gulen case? Different? Well, again, I think it was. Uh, first of all, it was uh, 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 a uh, political uh, upheaval for the country. Uh, that created uh, a great deal of uh, public outcry within Turkey uh, and uh, allegations uh, and requests that the Turkish government made about this extradition. So given all that, uh, we responded in a very measured way, but said in a very measured way publicly that we were going to evaluate this as we evaluate all extradition requests. Now, you did, you're right, we did confirm once we received that, because as the Secretary said in the immediate aftermath of that uh, failed coup attempt, uh, when asked about this very subject, would we extradite uh, Gulen, we said, he said, there's a process here. We respect that treaty that we have with uh, Turkey, and when we get a request, we'll okay. vet so that. So all that has to happen Sorry. in the case of Panama or any other yes, case is huge <laughs> is have public uh, political upheaval and a lot of the angry complaints, public complaints from the government and people. Is, is that correct? That's what tips the, uh, that's, uh, that's what uh, anyway. tips, makes the case? Once the DOG and the state uh, and the uh, courts are finished, then the Secretary of State signs off on the extradition. I think that's how the process works, uh, yes. I got one so more we'll come back. <laughs> uh, and that has to do with Venezuela. Close my book, come on. Venezuela and, yes, uh, the, oh, meetings, of course. Of course. and, the, and the meeting yeah. that um, Secretary Kerry had with President Maduro yeah. last night. Um, I saw the readout, um, which was, let's, shall we say, sparse on details, at the least. And I don't have, I, I only have one question about it. Others might have other questions. But I just, did the case of um, Josh Holt, the American who's been in prison, did the Secretary raise that with, um, with President Maduro? Uh, I know we're following those cases closely. Uh, we do raise them regularly with Venezuelan authorities. I can't confirm that it was raised directly with uh, President Maduro in the meeting yesterday. I cannot. 
So I'll, do you, do you know why the this is a pretty high-profile case? Do you know yeah. why it wouldn't have been raised? Why uh, the secretary wouldn't have raised I, it? I, I can't speak to it. I wasn't there, so I don't know how long the meeting was. I don't know how. I, I, I just can't. I'm sorry. What? I mean, I don't know why it wouldn't have been raised. Can, can, I, I can't can, confirm that it can, wasn't raised. Right. Well, can, can someone look into it just because, you know, the cases of Americans who are in prison, of course, and, you know, this is of your, course. what and, you say is your highest obligation. And, and what I can say is that we call on the Venezuelan government to respect due process and human rights. And as you know, we do take the welfare of American citizens very seriously. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks.